Ed DeRosa here at HRNHQ, pleased to be joined by Brian Aragoni, who will also be on hand for the Indiana Derby Day festivity Saturday at Horseshoe Indianapolis. It's Brian's first year doing the analysis, among others, for Horseshoe Indianapolis. And Brian, before we get into the all stakes, pick five that culminates in that Indiana Derby. I know there's been somewhat of a learning curve, as there should be with anyone tackling a new circuit. You're a few months in now. Are you more comfortable? I mean, I'd like to say yes, but there's still things and races that uh, happen each and every day that leave me scratching my head a little bit. But certainly getting used to a new track, new connections and who, you know, which riders ride for who and things like that is always a challenge. But certainly uh, a welcome one from my end. I've really enjoyed my time here at Horseshoe Indianapolis. And what a great track. I mean, this is a track that, frankly, I hadn't played uh, primarily in my handicapping repertoire very frequently unless there was a uh, carryover or something like that. But there's there's great racing here at Horseshoe Indianapolis. They've got a beautiful turf course, uh, a lot of races on the dirt as well, and I can appreciate, like everyone should, some big fields. Big fields, and uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the awesome takeout. Uh, I forget if Indiana's the one that does the 11.99 or the 12%, but – Either way, it's among the lowest in the nation at that level. And with competitive fields in this all-stakes pick five, definitely expecting a generous payout. Yeah, I mean, I think this uh, pick five turned out excellent. You end out with two grade three races in the Indiana Derby along with the Indiana Oaks. And I thought they both turned out like nice races. And it kicks off in race number eight. And I have no strong opinions. I mean, <laughs> this race looks wide open to kick off this pick five. I think it could pay balloons. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm really hesitant to lean toward a short price here. And there are some known individuals. Uh, Thomas Shelby, maybe not as known. Uh, this is will be his first race at Horseshoe Indianapolis, but certainly one I'm familiar with being trained by Robertina Diodoro. Morning line favorite Helium uh, and South Bend are both Kentucky Derby alums. Uh, and then there's Mr. Wireless, who won the Indiana Derby last year. I think they're all going to take money, whether it's on name or talent or both. But running Ray at 6-1 to one on the morning line kind of caught my eye shipping up for Joe Sharp. He's an E7 in the Bristnet PPs and definitely, uh, in my mind, going a mile 70 might have a pace advantage here. Yeah, I mean, I thought he looked tough in this spot. This is a race that I'm going to basically spread out and use as many as I can. Mr. <laughs> Wireless, the horse I didn't know what to do with. In this spot, I mean, ran great in the Indiana Derby last year, then won the West Virginia Derby over at Mountaineer, came back off of a layoff at Churchill Downs, didn't run all that well, but the time came up awfully quick. 133 at Churchill is lickety split, but then Vasquez, neither Gutierrez, who will be at Ellis this weekend. I didn't know what to do with Mr. Wireless, but I do know he loves this surface down on the inside. He could bounce back off of a rusty uh, layoff performance over at Churchill. I think he's one that I have my eye on, but you know, he's up in, up against it in here. Has he really progressed from three to four? That's a big question mark. Agreed. And I uh, will say the, uh, rail 29% at the meet at a mile 70, uh, the highest percentage of, of any post position by far. Um, so definitely inside, uh, the right spot for him, but, little nervous, like you said, about the move ahead to four, number one, and then he's a name. I mean, Pete, this is a day. There will be fans that maybe aren't at the track most other days. They're going to recognize him, and with that does come money, I think. So I, I fear he's an underlay, uh, certainly willing to watch the board. But at the same time, like you said, this is a competitive race and just going to take some fortitude to decide who I'm willing to let beat me and knock me out. I think, you know, he could have a, an advantage, not only breaking from the rail, like you talked about, inside runners have had a ton of success, but I see a hot pace in this race. I mean, it looks like Run and Ray wants to be on, if not near the lead. We know Thomas Shelby and Robertino Diodoro runners like to be on the front. That one should be fresh off of a long layoff. And then Helium adds to that pace along with Spa City. I think we could have a little bit of a pace meltdown in this spot. And uh, if we do, let's see, I guess South Bend and Endless Sunset are the two closers. Yeah, it looks like it. I don't know if Endless Sunset really has the quality of this group. Right. I mean, not that long ago with the $30,000 claim. Certainly looks like a nice claim, and they already got their return on investment bouncing up to 40 and getting the win. But from a class perspective, I just don't know, despite how fast they may go. But Southwest Racing Stables, these guys have had a ton of success in Indy for a long time. 
And then South Bend, uh, Brian Hernandez, a lot of jockey changes in this race. Cohen, I think the only one of the contenders who retains the mount, but um, looking forward, I'm going to have some stats for uh, the crew up there Saturday, Brian, but going to look at some of these jockeys shipping in and what they have done at uh, what was Indiana Grand the last time they rode there, but at Horseshoe Indianapolis, Brian Hernandez in particular, one I'm very interested in given his mounts throughout the day. So uh, it sounds like we're both in agreement, though, a spread race to kick things off. Certainly, that's for sure. All right, uh, one of my favorite named stakes races, the Snack Stakes, Mal on the Turf for this Indiana Breads or Sire. It looks like Indiana Breads, uh, three-year-olds. And uh, Moens is the morning line favorite, understandably so, off that last win. This would be his turf debut, and Sire Moeman, just 4% when his progeny uh, switch to the turf surface so maybe a chink in the armor at a short price certainly the fastest numbers wise but this would probably be a spot where i would say i'm against the favorite yeah i don't like mullins really in here at all i've gone back and forth on whether i keep him on the ticket or not but i think you know i agree with you he's he's a total play against i thought he was an easy winner last time out but as you know you know dirt to turf can be a big uh change i think latigo was a little bit headstrong last time out this horse by Jimmy Creed, you've got Steel Courage on the bottom. Now, the turf breeding is not excellent by any mean, but a perfect three for three going into the last race. Had a little bit of trouble into the first turn. I thought can handle the distance well. The turf will be another thing that is a bit of a question mark, but a long shot that caught my eye. Uh, you know, I think Mr. Chaos, along with Moens and even Latigo, a little bit are going to get over bet in this spot. I thought Amicable, a horse that. Doesn't really have a ton of turf breeding, and there's no doubt about it. Pulse number 11 is not an easy one. Wow. But second time on the turf, this is a horse that actually has turf experience, and I thought he ran way better than it looked on June 11th. He, he was in tight the entire stretch. He galloped out well. Ramos was aboard, got bet down that day to 3-1 to one in a full field of 11, and he hadn't really shown much before. There was a lot of question marks, and I think Amicable is a horse with experience on the turf and the synthetic that could go off at a big overlay price. i got to be honest, as you were talking, and I was, oh, 20 to 1, and I thought, oh, well, my horse is going to be even longer on the line, but he's not. He's 15 to 1. He's just to the outside. Now, the number power is by no means there with no proof, but he is 2 for 2 at Indiana on the turf, owner-trainer. This is the only starters the owner-trainer has had for the year, uh, but you do leg up. Joseph Ramos, who is aboard for both wins, Frank Angst loves that when the, the jockey is the only one who's won on the horse on turf. I even call it the Frank Angst jockey angle. Numbers-wise, definite need for improvement, but I just kind of can't get over the fact that this horse does have, I guess he was DQ'd, that's why he has two wins in maiden ranks, but I mean, clearly he's able to run his race on the turf, and I don't know, I'm, I think he'll be higher than 15-1 to 1 even, so... I have to take a shot and include them on the ticket. Yeah, and you want to talk about horses that progress. You know, we talked about Mr. Wireless, whether you progress or not. Look at the difference between no proof. Didn't show really anything as a two-year-old. And as a three-year-old, I mean, he's not only run well on the turf, but his start on the dirt was pretty good as well. And now that you mention it with no proof, in my long shot, Amicable, Joe Ramos hops off to stick with no oh, proof. So how about that? For you as well. <laughs> They do get the Derby winning uh, jockey aboard, though, amicable. But this, this might be a boxcar situation. And, you know, as we're, we're going sequentially, but in the opening leg, the Schaefer, uh, again, not really sure who I'd really be wanting to knock me out. But, I mean, if you're sitting on 11, 12 in this leg, and I like the seven a little bit too, who's a price, I mean, it doesn't really matter who wins the first leg if you get a $30, $40 winner in leg two and you're willing to beat the favorites. What did you think with New Year's Fever? That was a horse I, I really didn't know what to do with. I didn't think too much of the turf reading. I mean, the siblings are one for 22 in turf routes, a perfect two for two. I think that one could vie for favoritism with Mr. Mullins in here, and I'm just not sure how I feel about it. Yeah, uh, I mean, people love betting ones, and this one has them in spades as well as the the draw victories, one at 7 to 10 when stepping up to two turns. So. I kind of agree with you. I'm, I'm wondering if this one actually will be favored. Uh, I will say I like the turf breeding a little bit better than Mo wins for sure, especially with Stormy Atlantic on the bottom. But 
Yeah, I mean, it just it, it looks like the the horses who are kind of obvious on paper, not obvious in the sense that they're locks, but just the ones that are going to get bet, I think are going to get over bet. Yeah, and I, I thought it was interesting, you know, people say don't pay attention to jockeys, but when the big money comes out, there's a reason why, you know, big damn riders win races in fistfuls because they oftentimes have the most choices. And we talked about Joe Ramos hopping off amicable, but how about Ronnie Prescott giving uh, the old bounce to New Year's fav- Fever a perfect two for two? Um, hadn't tested stakes level, but he ends up on Mr. Chaos in here, and I think that was probably a tough decision for him and his agent. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, just looking through the, I mean, especially in the case of Ramos, it's not like John Schultz is his best trainer that, exactly. oh, I'm going to stick yeah. with this guy. I mean, he's, as far as I can tell, a one-horse barn. So, uh, yeah, very very interesting jockey machinations in this race. And uh, not part of the cross-country pick five. That could really blow that one up. But part of this all-stakes pick five, and I'm, I'm looking for prices uh, exclusively in this race. Yeah, and if you're tuning in to Horseshoe Indianapolis for the first time, maybe you don't pay attention to it. One thing I've learned as the uh, resident new guy is anytime Indiana bred step on the turf, expect the unexpected because the breeding for the turf for Indiana bred is not always there, and sometimes some crazy things happen. Yeah, and the purses are good enough that it makes sense to take a shot if, if you can run against state breads and – We'll see how it works out for, for Mo wins and, and others in there. But I, I kind of like taking a long shot who already has success on the sod. Uh, the next race in open states, plenty of success on the turf among uh, many of the contenders, PPs, including some like at Hot Brown, a, a very well-known name uh, around these parts for sure and a fun name to say. I believe he is the five. Oh no, Ivar is actually the two to one morning line favorite. Some like at Hop Round five to two. Both graded stakes winners, and I don't think either one has to win this race. I prefer some like at Hop Round to Ivar, but I wouldn't mind upsetting them both. Yeah, I mean this is a race that, and, and some like at Hop Round is a horse that I've followed for a long time, and I typically like to play against him. I always am trying to beat some like at Hop Round. He's usually heavily bet, and when I go deep, he usually wins, and when I <laughs> you know light he usually loses but i think some like it hot brown and ivar for me were just more classy than some of the others in here i mean ivar just ran in the breeders cup last time he's seen now with that you go from the breeders cup to a hundred thousand dollar stakes race that leaves some questions right there that leaves me a little bit concerned but then you know you couple in that they probably had a spot picked out at churchill downs they were probably going to run in another race this is plan B for them. And I, I think, think it's plan C even. Yeah. It, I mean, it probably is. And I still have the horse on top just based on class alone. They probably had another spot picked out. It's not ideal. It looks like Talamo came in for potentially this one. I know he's got other mounts as well, but Ivar, if ready to rock and roll, that's the big question mark. I think they're all running for a second in this spot, but he doesn't have a great post. And there's some others to take a look at in here. I mean, I couldn't kind of, I wanted to take this horse higher, but leading the charge, 30 to 1 morning line, Ooh. people will say, well, you're crazy. It's an Indiana bred for team block. And I know, I get it. It's a goofy pick. He's 7 for 13. But this horse just stopped the clock in 133. And I don't see this time coming up any faster than 133, regardless of how hard our turf course has been. The horse is 7 for 13. He's taken on open company in the past. And I mean, he just runs his race. He loves to win. He's seven for 13. He's going to be a million to one. I yes. get it. But he's a great horse to use underneath. All right. That's that's what we're here for. Obviously, the pick five we want to hit, but there's plenty of opportunities in the vertical wagers. I wouldn't mind seeing price talk uh, draw in. Uh, this, in part, uh, you know, uh, always the typical caution about the big number in the slop, off the turf, field of four. Uh, but this first off the claim for Cox, 26% in that setting, which for him is par. So I'm not saying that like, oh, look at how much he wins. But just noting that that he does as well as he does in any other category off it. And if he draws in, maybe you get the AE bump in price, especially in the pick five where people don't you know realize he's in and use it. But that 102 brisk net he got off the turf when he was claimed, did match a turf figure he got at Belmont when going nine furlongs. Uh, so, you know, a little bit of a cutback from his best. But nevertheless, if you take that number as legit, 
then I'm a little bit more willing to buy that, okay, he can run this triple digit number. And even Ivar has never run triple digit on the Brisnet scale. So price talk, if drawn in at double digits, I think is a use for me. But uh, certainly, like you said, uh, I think there are some potential in here. And it could be one of those cases where if you're building multiple tickets, Maybe Ivar and or some like at Hot Brown is the lean if you're really, really willing to go all in in the snack stakes and only use the bombs. Yeah, I mean, probably, you know, I, I, I'm a huge advocate of playing two tickets. I like to play two different singles. You know, usually I find three races that are very similar. And then the two races where I single, one of them single, the other one goes deep. In this spot, I haven't really decided if I'm just going to use some like at Hot Brown and Ivar or if I'm going to spread it out a little bit in here. We'll kind of see who ships in and who doesn't. But I agree with, you know, price talk. I, I happen to like horses that are claimed with a purpose and head right to stakes. Yeah, it's a big jump, and they went from claiming to stakes. But Mike Maker has made a living off of claiming horses. Oh, right. well, yeah. Races. And one thing I do like is, you know, we talked about this as plan C for Ivar. This is plan A for price talk in their group. You know, they had a plan. They put 80 grand down, and now they go right into stakes company and potentially have a stakes winner as well. Yep. Love it. All right. Well, uh, that leads us to, and, and basically, you know, again, if John Schultz wins the, the snack at 40 to one, I don't want to be bumped because Ivar runs off the screen uh, in his race. So just, it's always kind of balancing what you're, what, who, how you're willing to go out based on what's happened. One race I am absolutely only singled is going to be the Indiana Oaks for me, interstate daydream even if she probably will be the shortest price on the day, I just can't advocate doubling, tripling the cost of my ticket going against her. I think she looks extremely, uh, extremely tough in this spot. Yeah. I mean, she's got the most potential to probably run off the screen in here, in my opinion, that's, uh, she look she looks up she looks tough to beat in this spot but she's not all that consistent I mean I know she's three for five but she's kind of got that every other pattern going in here I know the Ashland was a grade one race and, and got pressured on the lead that day on a wet track I kind of was couldn't take my eye off of North County despite wanting to take my eye off North <laughs> County I just couldn't get away from it. It was a horse like I looked at first glance and I was like, no, no, no. And then I just, I kept coming back uh, to the six for whatever reason. Another horse who's three for five, uh, going to be tested for class in this spot, ran in the grade two Alexandria. Didn't really get um, a great trip that day, lost to Turner loose, but a horse that win right. We know the horse likes horseshoe Indianapolis, despite it being on the turf course. I thought North County would be an overlay in this spot, maybe a little bit higher than five to one but should get a great trip. I think potentially Interstate Daydream is going to be pushed in here by 63 caliber, maybe Silver Leaf, who's shown the ability to come from off the pace. One thing I got to ask you is, what do you think of these McPeak horses coming back on extremely short rest? Yeah, it, it's interesting. And I was going to ask if you've, if you've heard uh, anything official on Rattle and Roll when we got to the Indiana Derby. Uh, you know, Kenny, I know... Uh, cause the Iowa Derby drew first and rattle and roll was cross centered in there. And the horse won last weekend and, and Kenny was bullish. Like this was kind of the plan that we wanted to have this quick, you know, bang, bang with the graded stakes. Um, I don't know as much about the three-year-old Phillies, but I, I would have to think, okay, he kind of formulated this with the right horses. The big thing for me is that Kenny dispatches Brian Hernandez here. Uh, Tis the Bomb, who I love and I'm very excited to see run on Saturday in the Belmont Derby, gets Dylan Davis. And I don't think that's because, oh, Kenny could get Dylan Davis, and he did. Not that there's anything wrong with Dylan. He's the leading rider at Belmont so far. But in my mind, that Kenny purposefully sent Brian to Indiana, I think, uh, is, a, is a big positive for these horses that get Brian. Yeah, absolutely. And Silver Leaf is a horse that, you know, I've been following since the Gulfstream debut. I thought this horse ran well in the debut, showed speed, just need a little bit of racing experience. And then, you know, at Gulfstream, Keeneland Churchill ran into some tough foes and the likes of Falconette and Runaway Wife. And then last time I'll put it all together. I do think there's upside on Silver Leaf. That's a long shot that I don't necessarily believe is going to be 10 to 1 has shown the ability recently to sit a little bit closer to the pace. I think that horse could get a great trip with your boy, Brian Hernandez aboard. Yeah. 
hard to hard to disagree and i i do think uh you know kenny there, there's it, it's not just him being hustled maybe you'd say that if these horses were coming in off layoffs or there were so many other options but especially for phillies the chance to get this type of black type before the the, the big girls run at saratoga uh can't be undersold that said interstate daydream for me but uh an interesting race and certainly no gimme, but I kind of want a single somewhere because I like enough prices elsewhere. Uh, and then it's Brad Cox's world in my mind. We've seen this song and dance before. I do think best actor is the one to be in the Indiana Derby. Hopefully it stays together though, because this is a, a very solid, uh, solid group uh, for 300,000. Yeah, I mean, this will be my single. I think Best Actor is likely to go off heavily favored in this spot. Uh, Jenny Reese, our resident expert with everything, did talk to Kenny McPeak uh, over at Churchill, and she asked him about Rattle and Roll and the three-year-old Philly, and he, he said, our plan is full steam ahead. You know, unless any hiccups come up, we're planning to come. And he's, he said with Rattle and Roll, the horse is just doing well. We didn't really have to train up to the American Derby. We just galloped. So the horse still fresh, came back well you know, got through the feed bucket. So that five to two morning line, I believe is going to show up because that was a plan just a couple days ago when Jenny talked to Ken McPeak. So I do think rattle and roll is going to be in this spot. And I think best actor is the one to beat. Doesn't need the lead. Learned a lot last time out in the off turf event. I was a little bit, I just, I mean, I never question a guy like Brad Cox who wins at 25%, but I was surprised <laughs> they won impressively in the slop. And then they were entered on the turf. Uh, that was a little bit surprising to me. And then they come back in this spot. But uh, just trying to push all the buttons for that big purse money, I suppose. Although I'm trying to remember if that was the weekend they knew they were going to be off the turf, or maybe oh, Brad just yeah, was, that's possible was playing that game and you know got lucky. Uh, Unoho, uh, one of the enigmatic horses from the uh, Triple Crown Trail with that big upset. In the Rebel joins the uh, Diodoro Stables. That's always something to, to be uh, alert to. He's 24% first in the barn. David Cohen uh, getting the mount. And uh, he has the feel to me of one that people love to bet. One-eyed horse, etc. cetera. Um, six to one, probably still underlaid for me. I think he might actually even take more money than that, especially expecting maybe a few scratches from this field of 10. Yeah, no, he's a pitch for me. I don't forgive and forget. I'm kind of a scorn <laughs> horse player. And when he knocked me out in the Rebel of a good pick five, uh, you know, Unoho went on the play against list for better or for worse. So cool story. Don't get me wrong. I always wish the connection's the best of luck. But Unoho, I think he's a one-hit wonder. He won't be on any of my tickets. Yeah, agreed. And uh, King Ottoman, uh, headliner of the uh, pre-race uh, preview from Tammy Knox. Uh, she won the, uh, excuse me, he won the Texas Derby as a maiden. Certainly one looking to improve. He's by curling out of a tap at mare. So, uh, you know, who knows uh, as, as he gets older and the distances get longer. I actually thought they'd try him at a nine furlong stake next out. So the, the fact he showed up here for me, was kind of a little bit of a raised eyebrow. I just don't know that he's faster than uh, best actor, to be frank. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, we when I was at Canterbury Park, we saw a lot of these Texas horses coming up for, for stakes races or just regular races. And a lot of the horses, they have a tough time, I think, acclimating to other tracks. They have success down south, whether it's Sam Houston or Lone Star. And then they ship elsewhere in their buyer speed figures and their numbers. They come up uh, competitive, but they're racing, at least from what I've seen and my understanding of it, it's just they don't ship all that well usually on their first time out. So King Ottoman, uh, I haven't decided on him. I mean, three, Charmney, three chimneys is certainly ownership that you have to respect, especially when Asmussen gets his hand on a, a curling uh, colt in this one. But I do think he's a little bit of an underlay. And I would actually, uh, you know, I were calling the shots with uh, the, the Lowers. I might actually try to twist their arm into running in this spot. I don't know what kind of threat he would legitimately be to win. But given what we kind of talked about, the uh, turf pedigree, which I think is practically non-existent with that horse, and the 91 Brisnet speed rating last out on this track at this distance, he could get a piece of the $300,000 purse. I, I don't hate him in here underneath if they go this route. Well, not to mention, you know, a graded stake for an Indiana bread doesn't happen all that frequently. 
Um, and I think pretty highly of Mr. Chaos and Latigo. Those are two nice horses that he beat last time out. I think he's still improving. You know, he's won four out of eight, but he's only gone two turns two times. And in both times, he seemed to love it. Like with John Kenton Court last time out, mm. it looked like he was going to get swallowed up at the top of the lane, and he ended up wrapped up an easy winner. I was glad that I wasn't the announcer that day because I would have been waving <laughs> the white flag on Moltons. Luckily, uh, John G. Dooley never gave up on him, but he ended up winning that race relatively easy last time out. Yeah, he'd, he'd be interesting to me uh, to, to try to hook up with uh, with Best Actor for sure, who uh, I'm, I would definitely say my main ticket is going to single the Coxes uh, and definitely look to catch a price, especially in the snack stakes. And then based on maybe the board and the Schaefer, which is the opening leg, maybe willing to just toss whoever takes the most money there, gamble a little bit three or four deep against the favorite. Uh, that that right now, I think, is where my strategy is going. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one of my singles is going to be best actor. I think that horse potentially goes off favored in this spot. Anytime, you know, Flo hooks up with Cox, they're certainly taking money. But a horse that, aside from, I mean, there's nothing on the racing form that shows a big reversal of form. But what about trademark at 15-1? to 1? We talked about the winning percentage um, with inside runners. This horse gets Lasix for the first time. Is stakes tested? I mean, the connections thought highly of this horse running in the grade three Sam F. Davis, the Tampa Bay Derby, the Bluegrass. Yeah. This horse has taken on some of the best uh, three-year-olds uh, on the circuit, and Bay Hirano comes in for what I can tell is just two mounts. Now, Saturday, I'm sure he had plenty of other things to do and plenty of other races that he could have ridden, but him and Victoria Oliver have been sneaky good. They haven't won at a high percentage, but when they do win, it usually is your head and it's always at a price so i think trademark is probably a horse who could be sitting on a bounce back and maybe you just needed lasix uh yeah no it, it's hard to argue at that kind of price so uh no it's it's a it's a good race uh in terms of both you know i'd love to just be live to best actor with a good number if and get John Schultz home in the snack, but uh you know even vertically there's some opportunity here with that i'm guessing we'll see at least one scratch just because of the number of cross entered, but yeah, even a field eight or nine uh, should, should have some looks here and uh, great to see the Derby winning jockey, Sonny Leone. Hopefully uh, fans will get to uh, enjoy that and some other big names on hand, including us. We'll be there. That's right. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. I don't get down there as much as I'd like to, you know, the uh, main job tends to get in the way of my, my hobby gigs. So certainly the insurance gig uh, causes me a little bit of <laughs> not, not easiness getting down to Indiana as much as I love. But every time I go down there, the fans are great. I mean, one thing that I didn't recognize is how great of a situation they have. The building is in excellent shape. It's just a great spot to watch races so if you're in town yep. or even an hour or two away certainly make your way down there because it's great yeah. aprons wide open lots of uh, great sight lines and uh love the i mean they have the i'm sure indiana derby day they'll have even more food trucks and such out but the beer is always cold and the hospitality excellent so uh if you're able definitely uh check out live racing really any day weekdays is great too uh and if not adw of choice uh get involved in that all stakes pick five We'll throw our tickets up uh, in some years in a little bit. We'll make a graphic, but should be a good one. Good luck to us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Certainly appreciate it and looking forward to it. Not only do we have food trucks, we also have a cigar rolling station, which I'm oh. certainly uh, excited to check out before the end of the night. I'd prefer to roll something else, but no, <laughs> cigar will be okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Hopefully we're not rolling up our, our tickets. <laughs> yes, that's one thing we do not want to. Uh, very good. All right. Well, Brian, really appreciate it again. Looking forward to seeing you and everyone at Horseshoe Indianapolis. All stakes pick five, Indiana Derby Day. Good luck.